So returning now to the repair of the upper gudgeon to the trim tab, which recall was damaged by a tornado worm. Let's just bore the hole. It was almost exactly a 5 16 inch hole right into the uh, ash gudgeon. So presently fitting a Dutchman, which is just a piece of wood, also ash, which I'm going to epoxy into the cavity. And then on the outside, since I had to cut some of it away, I'm going to fit a scarf. Well, try as I may, I could find no way to clamp uh, the scarf into place just because of the angles. The clamp kept sliding off. So we're going to have to go with plan B here. So I ended up having to put a self-tapping screw in there just to clamp it in place. There's no way I'd get a clamp on that. So, and once the epoxy sets up, I'll back the screw out. Hopefully it'll come out easily. Okay, well the epoxy is cured. So now I go about uh, trimming off the excess on the scarf. I'll start off with a saw. Then use a handsaw just to cut vertical depth slots. And these will help me to chisel off the remaining bit of wastage. See the little bits of wood just come right off when I whack it with the chisel. And step three is to go at it with the bevel plane. And at that point, we have it almost into shape leaving only to go at it with the sander. So that's starting to look like something. The last step is I'm going to encase the whole thing in fiberglass roving and epoxy uh, for two reasons. One, hopefully to keep it dry and two, to create a barrier, which again, hopefully will keep out any more pesky teredo worms. And then following that, finally, I'm slathering, them, slathering on some epoxy mixed with a microballoons filler uh, to create a fairing compound. Good as new, I reckon. So I put some epoxy and fiberglass roving on the inside. This is the bottom gudgeon to the self-steering wind vane. And because uh, what happens after a while is it starts to wear. And you'll notice it's starting to wear because the trim tab, you'll start getting vibrations in the trim tab. And so the solution I found to that is you just put a little more epoxy and roving. And then you have to, uh, and you have to sand it so it just fits, so it's snug but doesn't have any friction. Mm, so that's not going to quite go in there yet. So we got to sand a little bit. That seems pretty snug. That seems pretty good. So I last left the mast with a coat of penetrating epoxy. And now I'm on, I think, the last or second to last coat of varnish. In the end, I'll put eight coats of varnish on top of that penetrating epoxy. 
which hopefully should keep it protected and looking nice for several years, I hope. Now I'm finally getting to some of the fun projects, like putting the name back on the dinghy using vinyl lettering. You might have noticed in the previous clips that the boot top had changed color. And indeed, I'm changing my color scheme a bit this year. So I'm going with a white boot top as well as a white cove stripe and lettering. So more traditional schooner colors. As previously, I'm still using a hard anti-foul for the boot top. I find if you use topside paint, for the boot top because it's getting dunked in the water so frequently the paint will usually start to blister up. So this time the only the only white anti-foul I could find was vivid was Pettit vivid paint. Uh, so that's what I'm using here. I decided to replace these pad eyes to the main sheet because because this was getting quite worn but this bolt was also about ready to let go. That's a good thing I decided to tackle it. So I took the opportunity to clean up the varnish on the rail around the pad eye. Now I'm just putting a little silicone goop in there. And uh, we'll install the new pad eyes. So right here is the tang where the standing end of the peak halyard used to attach and you can see it's heavily worn. But the other thing that would happen with peak halyards, especially when you're sailing off the wind, is that, uh, is that you're pulling at an angle. So this, this shackle would be pulling off to an angle when the, when the sail is, uh, uh, when the sheet is eased way out. And so you're getting a lot of side loading on this tang. Um, and especially when the sail slats, you're, you're going to get the, the, this sudden loading that, that's at an angle. It's like you're trying to break it off. Um, and supposedly back in the schooner days, there was a term for that. It was called ringing, where the peak halyards uh, w w were causing a lot of torque on the mast if you had them attached to a tang like this. So this idea is sort of an adaptation of what Warwick Tompkins did with Wanderbird. But what he did was he had a bale just coming around. So uh, uh, he just took a, a piece of, uh, I think it was galvanized steel in those days. But uh, you'd just make a metal bale that would go all the way around and then shackle onto a bale. So that the, uh, with a peak halyard attached, it could slide from side to side. So you're always sort of pulling at the center of the mast. So I'm going to attempt an adaptation of that which is instead of using a metal bale is to use uh, ducks here and just put a block on ducks and then pass it through a couple of fair leads and then I'll probably seize this and put some leather anti-chafe on the other side so that way it wraps around the mast so you're still pulling on the center of the mast you're not pulling sideways on a tang and causing a lot of torque and twisting Great day dawn. We have reached Cape Horn. Famous in history, story, and song. Hurricane winds in a high wild sea. A moving mountain range of waves. With last helm, the Wanderbird quivers, dips, and rolls onto tons of water that dash against our side.